So, um, over the past week or so, I've been trying to improve my speaking skills and improve my talking on the spot skills by sitting down in front of the microphone and recording a 10 minute session of just me talking about random stuff until I can't talk anymore, or me talking about random stuff for at least 10 minutes and talking about whatever comes to my head. And uh, I've been doing this steadily for about a week and a half now, and I've decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these 10 minute chunks of audio. I'm going to splice them together, and uh, about seven of them at a time, and then release them as a podcast, a weekly podcast, because why not? Why not actually make this a product? Because why not? (laughs) So this is it. This is the Coquino Podcast. Enjoy listening. The parts that I recorded don't really have too much to do with each other, and they might, like, I might switch topics randomly, and it might seem weird. Uh, hopefully the the kinks and all the weird stuff that happens will get fixed eventually, and it will be a great podcast in the future. But for now, it is the way it is, so have fun listening. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks. (sighs) When is my life going to start? When am I going to actually be pursuing something for real? I feel like all of my goals, they just disappear. They always just disappear. I need to... Like, have a a deadline or something. Because this isn't working out. This, This whole... Just do it when I feel like it. It never works. Just do it when you feel like it. never fucking works it's better to have a goal and it's better to have a deadline for that goal I'm afraid I'm afraid of committing myself to art I'm afraid of committing myself to anything even though it's the only thing that I'm really interested in doing like I'm not interested in watching movies or playing video games I'm only interested in making I'm only interested in making things it's crazy how that works. How, how even though I'm only interested in making things, I never make anything. I don't know how that works. I don't know what I do with my time. I don't even think. I don't even sit down and think. I enjoy it when I get to sit down and think, but I don't get to sit out, sit down and think often. Oftentimes, I'm just worrying about wondering about why I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which is making something. It's a horrible state to be in. You never want to be in that state. The state where you believe that you should be doing something and you're choosing not to do it. Horrible state. A lot of people call it procrastination, but I call it hell. It's so bad. And I don't know when it's going to end. I don't know when I'm going to actually make something meaningful. All I know is that I'm running out of time. I'm already 27 years old. And that may seem young to some people, but like... I don't know, people achieve a lot. And people, you can achieve a lot in 27 years. And I've achieved nothing. I've done nothing. And I don't... I wouldn't be sad if I, have a, if I hadn't achieved anything in 27 years. I'm sad that I haven't tried anything. Like, I haven't even pursued anything. That's what really gets me. That's what burns me. That I haven't pursued anything at all until now. The things that I have pursued before this have been sparse and tiny and meaningless and ultimately never amounted to anything because I never commit to finishing anything. So I don't know where my life's gonna go, but it can't keep going in this direction. This direction is a horrid direction that no one should ever go in. No one should ever go in the direction of nothing, the direction of mediocre, the direction of, I I don't even know. Like I would be more happy with myself if I had just spent time playing video games. Like, if I had just played video games for the entire seven years of my life that I've been doing this. 
or if I just watched movies for that entire time, I would be happy with myself. But I didn't. I just worried about what I was and what I wanted and who I... whatever. Stupid stuff. It doesn't matter. I think that I'm over that now, but I'm not even sure if I'm over that. I hope that I am. My life isn't bad, though. I'm not, I'm not poor. I'm not starving. <laughs> Overall, I'm, a, I'm pretty good when it comes to survival. When it comes to basic life needs, I have everything that I need. I have a job. I have food. I have family. So I don't need friends. I have everything that's, that's needed to make me feel okay. But what I don't have is stuff, is pursuits, is dreams. Dreams that I'm actually trying to pursue and trying to get to. That's what I don't have. And that's a shame. That is a absolute shame. I am ashamed that I don't have any dreams. That I'm not pursuing them with all of my might. I think that it's very, very important to do that. And I think that anybody listening to this, if you do have a dream, if you do have a dream that is good for humanity, <laughs> like if you have a dream of killing people, don't do that. But if you do have a dream that's good for humanity, I want you to pursue it. I want you to take steps to getting that dream to come true because on your deathbed, you do not want to regret not having at least tried to get it. All right? Yeah, I just feel, I, I feel awful about having not done anything. And maybe this is the start. Maybe this is the start of my great, bright, beautiful career of finally doing things. The career of life, not the career of money, but the career of life, living. I've always wanted to make things. That's what I've always wanted to do since I was a kid. When I was very little, I wanted to be a stuntman. When I was a little bit older, I wanted to be an animator. When I was a little bit older, I wanted to be a voice actor. When I was a little bit older, I wanted to be a Let's Player, a YouTuber. And now I just want to be anything. I want to do anything. I want to make things. Art. Art is what I like. I like to do art. So that's what I should be doing. But I don't do it. I don't know why. All that I've done art-wise in these seven years is try to figure out how to draw faces. And not even figure out, like, the perfect way to do it. Not, I haven't, still haven't figured out how to draw faces. faces. Faces are really difficult. They're, like, the most difficult thing to get down. To be able to draw someone's face from memory without looking at them, without any reference. To be able to make it look like it so, like, someone would be able to recognize it from your drawing. To be able to draw faces like, oh, what was that guy? What's the guy who did all, what's the, guy who did all the Coca-Cola ads? What's his name? That guy, the guy who, you know what I'm talking about. You know who I'm talking about. The American, the, the, the stereotypical American pop, pop art from the 1950s. That, that guy. <laughs> Can't think of his name. But he knew how to draw faces. And he could draw individually different faces. And I, I still can't figure out what makes them different from each other. I thought that I had figured it out a long time ago. Then I made a one post to 4chan saying that I thought that I figured it out and they made fun of me and I felt awful and I never felt good about drawing faces again. So, lesson, lesson to be learned about, about, you know, art. Never post your shit to 4chan unless you want to die, unless you want your whole belief in yourself to completely die. Never post to 4chan, because they will wreck you and destroy every sense of self-worth that you have. With like a simple keck or a simple, just a simple post. A simple one word post can do that. I don't know why. It's just powerful. It's powerful that way. But anyways, that's all I've done with art. I haven't worked on my webcomic. I mean, I've started so many projects, right? I started a, a long webcomic that was going to chronicle the entirety of a of My Little Pony fan fiction called Fallout Equestria a combination of the Fallout games and My Little Pony. 
a very well done like that doesn't seem like those two things would combine but you know they do they combine really well it's almost it makes it like it makes it a lot darker that it's about my little pony this fallout my little pony fallout quest here but anyways i was trying to do that i was trying to make that comic and i made the first chapter of it i made the outline of the first chapter you know the stick figures where all the characters were going to be located in the frames what the dialogue was going to be, how the story was going to be split up, because the way that the way that that story starts is kind of awkward and weird, um, and I need to figure out some way to make it not awkward and weird, not awkward and weird for like it's not awkward and weird for like a book format because you can see into inside the characters' thoughts, but if you're going to do a comic, you got to be able to look beyond the characters' thoughts, you, you, like like having a character think in a comic is almost cheating to me. You're supposed to see what they do and understand what they're thinking by seeing what they do and what they say. That's, that's, that's the way that I want to communicate the story. So I tried to figure out how to do that, and I did. And I wrote the first draft of that, and I, I storyboarded it, I paneled it, and then I never continued with it. If I had continued with it up until now, I, I had planned, I don't know how I was going to do this, but I had planned to, to try and release a chapter a week which is something that's impossible. I'm pretty sure it's impossible. But I, I had plans in my mind, like one day I would write the script, the next day I would do the outlines, then the next day I would do the inking, and then I would release the pages. Because I, I, I wanted to do that. And, and if I had done that, by this point, I started that, that thing back in 2012. If I had continued that up till this point, I would have gotten so much experience. Just on... On the fundamentals of drawing, on how to make a story work, and how to make it, how to keep it interesting for yourself, and also, and and the real weird thing about that, the real stupid thing about that, is I do not remember enjoying myself any more than when I was making that comic. That was the most enjoyable time of my life. Probably not in the midst of while I was doing it, but it was so fun to try and construct that. So I don't know why I didn't continue it. I, I don't know. I guess I, I felt worried about myself and anxious about myself and I was worried about it. It's just these blah, blah, blah problems. Blah, blah, blah problems. Don't know what I want. Don't know what I want to do. Don't know who I am. Blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't do that. And so now I have written the first chapter of a webcomic that I haven't... I have written the first chapter of a webcomic and I haven't, well, I haven't written the first chapter. I haven't actually written it. I haven't written the dialogue. I can't get the dialogue down. I can't get the characters down. I have written the outline of what happens in the story, but I don't know how to get the characters down. I suck at characters. I'm really bad at characters, and I'm really afraid to commit to writing a character because it's going to suck, and I don't want it to suck, but it has to suck because that's the only way you can get better is to realize that you suck and then fix what, you, what sucks about you, right? Yeah. So I don't know where I was going with this. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I This is things that I've talked about in so many other podcasts and so many other things. These are the only things that I've done with my life. Are these few things. And I need to do more things. Because it's just, it's just worthless to, like... I really like making things. I've always liked making things. So why don't I just keep making things? Why don't I actually just commit to it, take the steps to it, and just do it? I don't understand. I don't understand what is wrong with me. Maybe I'll figure out someday. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. The way to become better at at doing something is to do it over and over again. That's the idea that I have in my head. It's to do it over and over again so you gain more confidence in your ability to do it. But I don't necessarily know that that actually makes you better, per se. It just makes the part of you that is good mm, shine through more. It doesn't make the part of you that is good into a better part of you. It just makes you more confident in the you that you are. At least I think that's what it is. I don't actually know. I'm trying to come up with a topic for this uh, podcast, the Coquino podcast. I think I'm going to do one of these every day. Because why not? There's no real reason not to. Other than that, I'll run out of topics to talk about.
But I think that's that's something you have to do. You have to get yourself to run out of topics. That's the only way you're going to run into new topics. That's the only way you're going to be curious about things. you got to talk about the things that you already know about. So what do I know about? I know about hardly anything right now. I haven't been paying attention to the world. I subscribe to Philip DeFranco, which is such a normie channel, such a normie subscription. I almost feel ashamed that I subscribe to him. But I, I kind of want to be kept up with the goings-on in the world, and he seems to be like a dude who knows what's going on, or at least has a little bit of a slice of what's going on in this world. He tends to focus more on the online world, but he also adds a little bit of politics in there, and he's really good at explaining something it with decent enough language that I understand it. And so uh, I'm following him now. That's a thing. That's a new thing. I'm actually not sure if I like this. and that, it's, it's something I'm trying out, following that channel. Because I do think it's important to be kept up with at least some semblance of what's going on. Otherwise, you're going to be out of the loop. And you're not going to be able to, you know, relate to people. Right? There is some value to his channel. He does expose new things, and it's like he keeps constantly trying to show new things and new channels and new ideas. And that's good, and that's cool. I like that. So I guess that's why I'm subscribed. To get new information, new information that I haven't gotten before. I wouldn't think to look in the places that he looks for information. But what do I want to do with this? What do I want to do with, like, a YouTube as a career or as a a thing that I do as a hobby, whatever. I just don't know. I don't know. I've always wanted to do Let's Plays, but every time I try to do a Let's Play, it comes out unnatural. Like, I can't speak for some reason. I can't I can't open up my mouth and say normal things. I can only open up my mouth and say some some weird improv thing where I'm making up this weird kind of announcer guy voice, and I just keep on emphasizing on that, and then I just keep on talking about the meta, just keep on talking about, like, how I'm, I suck at this, and how I, I don't understand what I'm doing, and how, like, that's the only thing that I can talk about, and how, oh my god, what do I do in this game? What, what am I supposed to do? I'm always uncomfortable. And it's not fun to watch someone who's uncomfortable during a Let's Play. That's something that I, I know, because I've watched uncomfortable people before. And you can tell. You can tell when someone's uncomfortable with the things that they're saying. Like, they're not saying them with any commitment whatsoever. So, yeah, I don't want to do that if I'm going to do a Let's Play. So the practice of making Let's Plays... Right now, I'm not even uploading any Let's Plays. I'm just recording them just for the sake of getting the practice in. Because I know the ones that I'm recording right now, they're not really up to snuff. They're not really good. And I think that they could be better. When it comes to Let's Plays, I kind of have like a, a mixed feelings about the direction that they've gone in. Game Grumps, which is a Let's Play channel that I love, but they, the Game Grumps, Markiplier, PewDiePie, they all changed the meaning of what a Let's Play is into something like that's all about like comedy and being funny all the time. And uh, it's obviously made them very famous and made got them a lot of views and channels, but I don't think that that's exactly what a let's play was about you know back in 2008 when let's plays were a new thing it was just a guy or a girl sharing their experience playing a game and it wasn't necessarily funny it was just you know nice it was nice it was nice and fun to watch and sometimes funny things happened sometimes weird things happened it was like a magical experience that's what I miss. I miss Let's Plays that are magical. Little magical experience. Is that all I have to say about Let's Plays? I guess so. Anything else to talk about? Um, not really. I guess I could describe what I'm doing to make money right now. Why not? No one knows. I work at an internet service provider. I answer phone calls all day. And all I have to do, pretty much, is like take payments... People call in with their credit card number, I enter that card number, and I take the payment. I put them in the automatic payment, and that's pretty much all I do all day. There's a lot of off time. I have a lot of time that I can just browse Reddit, or just watch YouTube videos, or whatever. Which is nice. 
and it's twelve dollars an hour which is minimum wage here but it's pretty decent I'm just saving up money right now I don't know what I'm gonna do with it I, I'm kinda like weird about spending money I don't like spending it spending money makes me nervous I don't spend money unless it's on something that's really important to me like I spent money on this laptop that I'm using this thousand dollar laptop that was like the last purchase that I made the last big purchase the only other things that I've ever spent money on are like food and this microphone that I'm using, you know. Equipment for making things. I bought a few games, but only for the purpose of doing Let's Plays with them. I don't like spending money just for myself, and that might be a bad thing. It might be like the pendulum is swinging way too far into the conservative side. Maybe I should spend a little bit of money on myself. But I haven't done it. I guess I, I want to save up because... If I'm going to make some kind of investment in the future, I want to be able to do it. And if there's going to be some kind of opportunity that requires a decent amount of cash, I'm going to have that cash. And I'm going to be able to make that investment. That's kind of what I'm thinking. And I don't like spending money on something that doesn't make me money, that's not a potential to make me money. It has to either have potential to make me money, or it has to, you know, have potential to keep me from dying. You know, like food. I can spend money on food. I can go to Chipotle, I can go to Burger King, I can go to McDonald's or whatever and spend like $5 or whatever. But I can't spend money on anything else. And that's absolutely okay. Anything else I can talk about? I mean, my internet service provider job, it's cushy and easy, just sitting around all day. But it's also kind of boring. And I wonder if it's stagnating my brain a little bit. Because, you know, when you do the repetitive things over and over again, time kind of just slips away from you. But at the same time, I have a lot of free time during that job. I could be doing so much more than just looking at Reddit. I could be reading novels, getting caught up, like, filling my literary repertoire with more books, with more knowledge, gaining knowledge, looking up philosophy, looking up, you know, history. And I've tried to do that. I mean, I read... 1984 during my work and it was a really good book and I got into it and it was interesting and I read a lot of Shakespeare I read like most I think I've read more than half of Shakespeare's works at this point which is quite a feat Shakespeare actually surprisingly he wrote a lot of plays and I read at least half of them at work and maybe I should continue reading them I don't know I am trying to get like more cultural knowledge so, I guess I have to resort to doing the editing thing. I'm going to edit these vlogs. I'm going to cut out all of the, the wheat and chaff and just keep the stuff where I'm saying something interesting. It's going to make it a lot easier for you guys to listen to, anyways. Anything else I can talk about? Like, I need to like talk about everything. That way I'm going to like want to think about new things. Well, reading Shakespeare, I can talk about that. So, reading Shakespeare is weird to me. I figured out or, or, or looked up how to do it, and it's like you're supposed to read it with like a meet, like a metrical beat to it. Every single line in a Shakespeare play is supposed to go da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. I can't even think of any examples from the from the plays themselves, but an example of speech like that would be: I sense a great disturbance in the force, and then I go, and then I go, and then you know, it's something like that. And I'm supposed to read it like that. And when I do read it like that, I do get a different feeling from when just reading it like prose. There's a lot more of viscerality to his words. Because you, when you read something like a poem and you stop at every line, you start to notice what happens at the end of that line and what happens at the beginning of the next line. And sometimes it, the, the connection between those two words causes a very visceral feeling to erupt in your soul. But I still don't quite understand what's happening in the... Like, I, it annoys me because I don't understand exactly what they're saying. I get the gist of what they're saying. I can understand pretty much what's happening. But it's never fun to understand pretty much what's happening. It, it makes you feel like you're a kid again. You don't understand English. I don't even understand English enough to be able to understand Shakespeare. It's weird. And sometimes there's moments where I understand everything. But oftentimes that's not the case. And maybe that's just because I don't have enough literary knowledge, enough of a vocabulary. I often have to look up words when I'm reading Shakespeare. But I don't find that, like, embarrassing or anything. There's a lot of words that he uses. He has a, a very dense 
lexicon. Is there anything else I can say about Shakespeare? People always say that he's really, really great, that he's like one of the best playwrights around, that he's really good at drama. And I don't know. I don't know if I can see it. I, I can't really see it. Maybe it's because I don't understand enough English to get what he's saying, but he seems very... Like, he lingers on words too much, and maybe it's just I'm not that big a fan of too much language. I prefer no language, no words, no dialogue, just silent moments. Like Mad Max Fury Road style, where there's hardly any dialogue, there's just a, a bunch of stuff happening, and you understand what's happening because the context is there from the camera angles and the way that people react to things. That's what I like. And if people use words, I want them to feel real and it's hard to believe in a character feeling real when they're all speaking in this metrical verse this metrical poetry it makes it all so weird and it's hard to get into at the same time it's also interesting once you do get into it because it does have a rhythm and the, once you do get into that rhythm you start to feel it you start to feel what it feels like to be in the world of shakespeare like, because of that, because it has such a standard rhythm to it, it kind of forces you to notice all the differences in that rhythm. And it kind of forces you to get this, this, this like your heart starts beating with that rhythm. And you just feel like the whole thing is flowing in front of you. 1984 by George Orwell was an interesting read. I read, like, the first half of it during one day at work and the next half of it during the other day. The first half, it's like... It wasn't as creepy as it, I, I think it was supposed to be because in that day and age, you had to have like a giant square box of space in order to fit a camera. So there were less cameras than there are now. And then like I told people that like, yeah, this, this not, it's not nearly like, or 1984, not nearly as creepy because it's already happening now. But then I read the second half of that chapter, the, the part where he gets captured and then slowly psychologically forced to love Big Brother and then to kill himself, or to want to die and love Big Brother. And it's, it gets forced to like admit that false, the, what's false is what's true and all that. It, be, it becomes like so much creepier toward the end. And I understand why people call that like a really creepy outlook, a really creepy book, a creepy futuristic... I can't use words correctly, but I understand why they call it creepy now. Creepy, I hate using the word creepy, but whatever. Is that all I gotta say? I guess. This is the end. Happiness is kind of disturbing to me. I feel a lot of happiness right now, but it's hard for me to believe in it. Because how could there be this much happiness? I'm like very... I feel so uncomfortable. With like... And... I don't even look happy right now. I just like there, there's like this feeling inside my gut of happiness, and I don't understand how there could be that much happiness in the world. I think this is what depressed people go through. They run into happiness and they don't know what to do with it. They don't see it as as real. How could how could that be real? How could that possibly be real? That I feel this happy. How could this much happiness even exist? How could it be possible? No, 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 I have to be sad. I have to be sad. I have to be like in denial about about something. I'm in denial. That's what's going on. <laughs> I just think I'm just trying to trick myself into being happy. That's what's going on. It's so weird. I, I don't understand it. I really don't. It's confusing. Ah, oh, man. It, it's very, it's, it, I don't know what to say about it. It, I think the happiness is real, because I do feel it. But it's also like, it's a different kind of happiness from the kind of happiness that you, that you would want to experience. It's the kind of happiness that you don't necessarily want. It's just there, because of the result of something but you don't necessarily 
I just... I can't explain it. I don't even know if it is real, honestly. But I have realized that I, I've felt this before, a lot of times. And I've always said, well, that's not real, that can't be real. How could that be real? Because it really is so much happiness, there's so much to it. It's so infinite and abundant. And it's hard to believe in it. It's hard to believe in it, I'd rather not. I'd rather just be, just go back to being depressed or sad or something. I'd rather, because at least with that, just like, it's not infinite. I mean, at least with that, there's some semblance of control. This is like uncontrollable happiness, you know? And it disturbs me. It disturbs me and makes me feel weird. It makes me feel like I'm not being myself. That's another thing. I think a lot of people who are depressed are afraid that if they let go of their depression, they won't be themselves anymore. But what does it even mean to be yourself? Does it mean to just be sad all the time? Just because, like, you're trying to be in character for a character that doesn't really like living. Why would you want to be in character, in that kind of character? Don't we always wear masks, even to ourselves? Why would you want to wear the mask of something like that. I, I don't know. These are just thoughts that I have. I don't know if I want to ever share them with people. But I'm recording them because I'm trying to make at least one of these recordings a day, one of these Kokino podcast recordings a day. <sighs> I don't know if it's real. I don't know if it's real. Happiness comes from the complete lack of any desires. I think. Like, when you desire something, you're not happy. You're passionate, maybe. You're uh, dedicated. You're motivated. But you're not happy. It's only when you finally get that thing that you wanted so much that you feel happiness. But I think, really, human beings kind of trick themselves in that way. I think that if you just let go of all of your desires, which is a scary thing to do, and I don't even want to do it. I don't even want to do it. It makes me so uncomfortable to do it. But if you just let go of all your desires, all you'll be able to find is happiness. It's very weird. Very strange. But you can see this in children. Like, children can be very, very sad, but they usually eventually let go of that sadness, and then they're so happy. They're so happy when they get that one thing that they wanted so much. They're able to enjoy it. They're able to enjoy something so tiny with such stronger feelings than adults. And I think it's because... The whole idea that happiness is something that we don't have is a lie. Happiness is something that we do have. But we also have this desire to move. And once we have this desire to move, then the happiness gets put on hold. Because we, 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 I think we, we take our happiness, our natural born happiness, and we put it on hold. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna be happy until I have this thing that I want. I'm not gonna be happy until this thing, this arbitrary thing, completely arbitrary if you really think about it, is satisfied. Now, maybe it's maybe it's it's difficult. It's probably a lot more difficult to find happiness if you don't have basic survival down. Like if you're starving. Well, of course you're not going to be happy because you're starving. Or if you're uh, you're thirsty, you're dying of thirst, or you know, you're sick, or you you know, you're in pain. You're not going to be able to be happy, but I'm talking about I think a lot of depressed people are perfectly healthy and have 
a decent amount of money and they're surviving through life, but they're still sad. That's, that's like the majority of people who are depressed are sad. I mean, they wouldn't be depressed if they had to go and survive. If they had to go hunt for food every day, they would be motivated and dedicated and they would enjoy every single time they ate, right? But I don't know what I'm going. I don't know where I'm going with this. Um, I feel motivated. But if they just, I don't know, just let, I don't even like the idea of letting go of desires. I think desires are, are somewhat a good thing. I know, I think I know deep down that happiness is kind of a natural state that we exist in. And uh, desires prevent that happiness. But the prevention of that happiness is, maybe it's a good thing. Because it makes us create things that are beautiful, like art and stuff. But I think that sometimes we should just let ourselves be happy. That makes sense, right? I think we have a lot more control over our emotions than we think we do. A lot of people think that their emotions control them. When they're angry, they can't help but be angry. When they're sad, they can't help but be sad. But I don't think that's true. I think that Really, your emotions are just this a tool. They're a tool for you to survive and to live life and to get the things that you are interested in, the things that you want. That's what, that's what emotions are for. And if you use them for anything else, then you're just... You know, if you don't want to feel sad, just let go of sadness... That doesn't make any sense, and it sounds stupid. And I'm probably going to not show this podcast to anybody this episode. Because anybody, because people who are still holding on to the idea that their emotions control them won't believe this because they're using their emotions to drive their thoughts and their emotions are going to say that this is wrong and this is false, that obviously he doesn't understand what I'm going through. Obviously he doesn't understand what I feel. Obviously, he doesn't understand that I have no control over myself. But you do. You just don't know it. You just got to realize that emotions aren't the out to get you. They're not evil. Uh, a good way to, to, to actually experience this, if you want to try it, it's going to sound stupid. And uh, it sounded stupid when I, when I heard it first. When I first heard it, it sounded like the stupidest thing in the world. But what do you want to do if you feel an emotion and you don't like feeling that emotion and you don't want to feel that emotion? You look at that emotion or you think about that emotion. You address that emotion. You ask that emotion if it wants to leave. Ask your emotion if it wants to leave. It's the stupidest sounding thing in the world. But the funny thing is, and it's and what your ego will say, because your ego is always saying shit that you don't want. Your ego is always saying stuff to, to, to put you down. What your ego will say is, of course my emotion would say no. Or of course my emotion would say no, I do not. But if you actually ask your emotion, the answer is yes. It's so stupid sounding. It's so stupid sounding even saying it right now. Like you wouldn't understand it. You don't understand how, st how stupid it feels to do that. But if you do it, if you actually do do it, if you, if you get brave enough to actually ask your emotion if it wants to leave, the answer will always be yes. And maybe through doing that exercise you can realize that you're kind of the one who's holding on to it. It's not holding on to you. That's all I have to say. Emotions. I can't believe I went to this talk again.
this is a subject that I know a lot. This is a subject that I've thought about a lot. And really, I'm only like spewing out the release technique stuff that I learned about. Look up the release technique online if you want to discover more about this. It's weird. It's awkward. It's, it's like this new age weird shit. But I think this part of it's true. This part about emotions and the way that they work. It's true. So yeah, that's the end of this podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. I don't even know if I'm going to edit it. I, I'm too tired to edit it. Ugh. I'm just going to save it as a wave. Maybe eventually I'll edit it. If I ever upload any of these podcasts. So, I have decided, out of the blue, to try and broaden my musical horizons. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to listen to as much music from the classical history of music as I can. I've gotten a list of all the composers up on Wikipedia, all the composers from every single era, every single period, you know, you got your medieval, renaissance, baroque, classical, whatever. I'm just going to go through that whole list, search for those those names on YouTube, and listen to all their songs. Or listen to some of their songs, get a sample, because eh, listening to all their songs would probably take the rest of my life. In fact, I don't even know if this is going to get that far. There, there are so many composers, and there is so much music. It might be better just to look for someone else's list. But I feel like the only way you can be legit is by going after, like, making your own list. Finding the stuff that actually gets you interested. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. And uh, this is something that I actually tried a while ago. Way back when I was, like, in my 20s, I, I, I decided to do that. And I listened to, like, a ton of music. I... For some reason, I didn't start the medieval period, which is the the first period of like the when they first started writing music. No, I started the uh, Renaissance period. And by the time I figured out there was a medieval period, I had already gone like halfway through the Renaissance period, so I didn't want to go back <laughs> and start listening again, because the process of it. I've already started listening to the songs. The process of it is kind of painful and boring sometimes. Because the way that music is formatted and the the things that people musically responded to back then are different than the things that we musically respond to now. Back then they had a different sense of what made a song catchy, a different sense of what made a song beautiful. And in order to really appreciate that music, you have to listen to a lot of it and you have to recognize what those patterns are. Like, we have a lot of patterns in our own music right now that we listen to all the time. Like, we got that that famous, those famous four chords that are in, like, 50% of all pop songs or whatever. We got, like, we got a bunch of stuff. And I'm pretty sure back in those days, they had a bunch of stuff, too. So right now I'm listening to a bunch of hymns, because most of the music that was written back in those days was music for, for church, liturgical stuff. And hopefully I'll be able to listen to some secular music too, because hymns tend to be a little bit boring. I think I understand where they're going with hymns. The reason that they're kind of like not really meant to be digestible in the same way that like something secular would be. It's mainly the effect of a hymn is supposed supposed to make you feel like you're floating up toward the heavens, like you're actually in the heavens. So it's very floaty and very melodic and kind of like a mesmerizing and hypnotizing. Like the Gregorian chant and all the other kinds of chant. It's interesting. It's interesting once you, once you get into it, it's pretty fun. It's pretty it's a pretty interesting experience. It's like a drug trip almost. Uh so that I, there's that. That's what I started doing and I actually do hope that I can get a better knowledge of because I I have like this little dream inside of me to be a composer one day. But I don't want to go to a school and study music theory. Actually, I wouldn't mind going to school and studying music theory. I just don't want to pay for it right now. Um so I I just want to get like a an actual and, and I like the idea like I'm romantically attracted to the idea of just having like a feel for music not necessarily knowing how to write it down and express it although i do know enough music theory to probably write down most things but 
I like the idea of having a feel for it. Like you've listened to so much music that you just you just get it. You get you you have an understanding of what makes it tick and what makes it work that's innate to you. And when you produce music, you produce it from this instinctual side of yourself and not necessarily from an intellectual side of yourself. Because I tend to, I guess, value instinctual actions better than, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I, I'm an actor, kind of. I like acting. I like being, you know, adopting a character becoming someone else for a, for a, and what you, you, you kind of have to act on instinct it's not really an intellectual thing that goes on in your head it's just basically you believe that's the way that it works for me i don't know it might work differently for other people but i can almost tell when i see people acting on intellect like they're using their intellect to decide how someone should act and it always feels wrong to me or it looks wrong and i think maybe i'm maybe Maybe I think I'm seeing more than I think that I see, and I'm just like, I don't like something, and I'm just attributing a reason that, that, that I've taken off the top of my head to make me feel better about myself, to make myself feel smart, and myself feel perceptive about what good acting is. Maybe I'm just doing that, and it's actually not that, and I actually don't have the vision. I actually can't see whether someone is acting well or not, or whether, whether they're acting intellectually or not. But I, I don't know. Maybe that's true. But I just I just have this feeling I, when I see people act intellectually from from their intellect and not from their heart, it just it has a it looks different. That's that's basically it's a belief that I have, and I don't think that it can be proven unless you take someone's you take someone who's acting on instinct and you scan his brain and you take someone who's acting on intellect and you scan his brain and see the difference and i don't even know if there is a difference this this is just like conceptually from the understanding that i have in my own head there is a difference but i don't know if there's a real difference but anyways uh anything else that i have to report for the coquino for this uh the fourth episode of the coquino podcast feel a lot of a lack of motivation to do things even though i'm doing things uh, it's easier actually you know what let's talk about that it's for some reason it's a lot easier for me to pursue things and do things when i'm outside of my own house outside of my own room i found this to be true when i went to community college too whenever i was at the campus i didn't really feel like hanging out I felt like that was a place to do work. That was a place to do studies. So whenever I had time off, I would actually just go to the library, pick up a book that I was interested in, like some kind of topic, some kind, like the, the history of China or, uh, you know, the tale of Genji or something, and just read. I'd just read. And I was just motivated to do that. And I feel the same way whenever I go to work at, at, at the internet service provider that I work at. I feel motivated to to read something or to learn something it's a lot easier to do that when i don't know when i'm at a, at a different place than home when i what it's like i shift into the mode of work i remember i was an intern at my dad's office and i did the same thing like i was composing tons and tons of music i probably composed the most music i ever did when i was an intern at that office because it's just like something about being in a different place, being in a place that's made, you know, that people say it's for work. This is where you do your work. Just having that place makes it so much easier to do actual work. So that makes me think maybe I should try that. Maybe I should try to find a place where I can do work or set up a place where I can do work. Maybe it's not as complicated as getting an office, an office space. Maybe it's not as complicated as leaving the actual house. Maybe it just has to do with there has to be a space where work is that's defined as this is the place where I work. This is the place where I do my job. That seems like a good idea. I'm going to I'm gonna think about ways that I can do that. Um, anything else to report? Anything else to report? Uh, I don't know. There is nothing else to report. This has been Coquino Podcast. Uh, these tend to last about 10 minutes or so. So uh, hopefully they'll get longer because 
it seems like it's more entertaining to listen to something that's longer than 10 minutes. But uh, even if they don't, this is fine. I'm happy that I did this. Good. Awesome. Great. So, at the moment of recording this, I cannot think of any topics that have come up recently, so I'm going to talk about some I'm going to talk about some topics from my past. This is a pretty recent past, so it's not that unrelevant, I guess. But a little while ago, it was raining, and I decided to go walking through the rain with an umbrella, with no jacket, so it was freezing cold, but with an umbrella, which is something that I've never really done before. It's it's very weird to think that such a normal experience has never been had by me, that I've never actually walked through the rain with an umbrella. It's very interesting. You don't get wet. Or, like, that's the way that I pictured it. I pictured it like you wouldn't get wet at all. You'd just be... But it's not exactly that. Like, the bottom part of your, you like, of your legs starts getting wet because that's where the rain can get to. But the top part of you, the part of you that's under the umbrella, that stays dry. And it's a very different experience. It makes the rain... Like, normally, I don't really like walking through the rain because I get wet, and getting wet makes you cold and makes you not feel like walking anymore. But if you have an umbrella, you get the experience of walking and also the being able to see this unique environment that is caused by rain. Because it's like the world is completely different. Everything's completely different. But if you don't have an umbrella to protect you from like getting hit by the rain, you can't see that difference. Because the rain is too distracting from it. So it was really fun. I walked all the way down the road, and then I uh, like stood by like a a little pond river thing that we have, just stood there and thought for a few moments, looked up at a lamp light. It was really fun. I like doing that kind of stuff. I'm kind of like uh, my love language is the five love languages. If you've ever read that book, my love language is definitely quality time. So I like just doing things where you're just hanging out, just sort of spending time, not necessarily you know, being productive per se, but just spending time together. There was a, what was the video game? Chrono Cross. In the video game Chrono Cross, uh, I didn't play the whole thing, but at the beginning of the video game, there's this moment where uh, you're talking to this girl, or or like you're supposed to like do some sort of like fetch quest or something, and eventually you you get like this necklace for this girl. Uh, You've known this girl for a long time. And then uh, after that, you get to go down and sit down by the beach, and then you, they have, like, a discussion. And she says something that, like, really, really made me feel so romantic. It was like, remember when we used to just come here just to just talk? To just sit and talk? She said something like that while they were sitting at the beach, and I thought that was, like, the most romantic thing that I've ever thought of. That's that the, most, the most beautiful thing that I've ever, I've ever heard. Just, ah, oh, I, I love just the idea of spending time that way, of just existing for a short moment, maybe for a long moment. Existing, like the idea of just getting lost in that environment, getting lost in that conversation that you're having with someone to the point where hours and hours pass, or on the opposite side, to the point where even if only five minutes have passed, it feels like it's been hours. I really like that kind of stuff. And, uh, hmm, do I have anything else to talk about? I don't know. Let me see. I bought Mass Effect a while ago. And I wanted to buy it so that I could do a Let's Play or a live stream of it. But... I quickly realized as I was doing a live stream of it that it's not really the kind of game that you can really add anything to, right? You can't, or that, or maybe I just felt really too too nervous to add anything to it, but it didn't feel like the game that I could add anything to because there's so much dialogue and there's so much stuff going on that it almost feels like I'm I'm taking away from the experience of the game by adding to it. So I don't know if it's a good idea. So like that... that 
I've always questioned whether Let's Playing is even a good thing. I think that it is because I've always appreciated watching Let's Plays, but I wonder if it just takes away from the experience that you get while playing the game. I wonder if it's better to just play a video game, even though it takes more effort. Like, it takes a lot less effort to watch someone play a video game than it does to play a video game. But um, maybe it's better. Maybe it's better to just play the game. I don't know. I guess what I really mean is if you haven't played the game before, you probably shouldn't watch a Let's Play of it. Or you probably shouldn't watch the entire Let's Play of it. You should just watch, you know, enough to know if you want to play the game. That's usually what people use Let's Plays for, right? The majority of Let's Plays that aren't famous people, right? They just want to see footage of the game and see if it's the kind of game that they're interested in playing. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that the experience of playing that game, I'm kind of realizing that maybe playing a game for the first time shouldn't be done live. And it might just be because I'm not too good at doing it. I, I'm not too good at like adding any value to that because my first reaction is just to be silent and to experience the thing, right? To experience the thing without talking. And there's a lot of people in the world who are social and like to experience things while talking. And if, if people are watching them play a video game, maybe they'll even play it up a bit. But I'm not really like that, I don't think. When I play a video game, it's like I like to focus on it. I like to get involved in it and not necessarily get involved in showmanship. I like to get just lost in the story. It's kind of like reading a book. You you don't really announce what your thoughts are about what the book is. Like you don't you don't see audiobooks where people are reading a part of a, a part of the book and then and then they talk about their thoughts about the book and then reading another part. The audiobook is just an audiobook. And maybe let's play should be similar. I don't know. Let's I mean that's that's a walkthrough. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm lost in thought. And, you know, I feel like I need to actually come up with real thoughts before I start speaking into this microphone, but they're never going to come out. Real thoughts just elude me for now. Is there anything else I can talk about? Is there anything else I can talk about? Oh, there's another thing from the past. Uh, for my birthday, my mom and dad got me an electric guitar, and I haven't been playing it. And part of the reason that I haven't been playing it is because the amp hasn't been working correctly. You know, like the you try to play like a power chord and then the amp goes <laughs> and it breaks up. And that's because it's an amp that's running on a 9 volt. That's probably not the best amp for an electric guitar or an amp for playing rock and roll music. But another part of it is I'm just... I'm at this kind of standstill where I don't necessarily want to be productive. Part of the reason that I'm doing this whole podcast thing, Coquino podcast or whatever you want to call it, is to jumpstart myself into production. Because I've, I've noticed that in life, uh, when I actually do make something, it inspires me to make more things. And when I, and funnily enough, and, you know, egotistically enough, when I watch my own stuff that I've previously made, that also inspires me to make more things. Like, the most inspirational thing, the thing that inspires me most to keep making things is the fact that I have made things. It's really weird. I don't think I was always like that. But I am now. And so that's why I'm making this. I'm not really making this to make good content, necessarily, or because it has to be made or whatever or because I have a, a particular passion about it. I'm just making it to just get into the habit of making things every day. Got to make something every day. I mean, I even started uh, every day whenever I go to work, I have a journal that I write into sometime during the, the hours that I'm in the office. It's like I write like a really long paragraph. I don't, don't no, no line breaks, no nothing, just a bunch of words. And I write that, and I've been doing that pretty steadily, you know. There's times when I've missed it, but that's when, like, work has been cut off randomly. Like, my boss will sometimes notice that no one's calling the internet service provider, and he'll be like, you know what, we don't need this many people here now. 
you can leave. And then I leave. And then that's that's the times when I forget to ent put an entry into the journal. But um, I've been doing that. And I've been doing that since uh, December. Pretty consistently. And I wonder, is it helping me to be more productive? I think that it is. I think doing something regularly does help you become more productive. Now, this is probably one of the most low effort regular things that I could do, but it's still helping me. And I think that that's a good thing. I think that um, maybe this will inspire me to make more things because I do like making things. It's like one of the only things that I like doing. I like to make things. I like to think about things, but I also like to content. Content, the, the creation of content is fun. So, 10-minute mark has been hit. I'm wondering if I should just stop or if I should just continue. Well, I have nothing else to say. I had nothing else to say pretty much at the three-minute mark of this. So uh, the rest after the three-minute is kind of like, meh. But whatever. This is a podcast, and it's consistent, and I'm trying to be consistent about it. So I guess I'll see you guys next time on the good old-fashioned Kokino podcast. This has been episode five. <coughs> so, if you haven't learned anything about me yet, uh, here's something. I'm very, very good at starting to do things, like starting a project or starting a thing, but I'm not very good at following through, so I start a lot of things. And I'm just saying that because I started another thing that I'm not sure if I'm going to finish. I started learning how to uh, sight-read music, which... Uh, is something that I never got around to doing, or I never thought about getting around to doing. But I finally understand the meaning of the, the do, re, mi, fa, bleh, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. I understand what that means now. Every one of those is representing an individual note on the scale, on the standard major scale. So that's interesting. That's good. I'm glad that I'm learning that. I'm trying to learn how to I think that it would have been a lot better if I started learning this when I was younger, because when you're younger, your brain is a lot more flexible with that kind of stuff. I don't think it's impossible to learn now, because I, I, I know it. Like, I know all what all the notes... I know... It's not that I know it. I don't know it directly. I know it indirectly. Like, I know it through passages, through relations, but I don't know it through every note specifically what it is represented by like if you were to ask me to do a test and to complete whatever fill in the note where it's where it's correct i would be able to do that but it would just take me a really t a really long time i guess you could say that i know it but i'm very very slow at it so that's something that i was learning and now that I've, it's only been like two minutes of explaining that anything else i can say about that i need to get better at expanding on what I mean because two minutes isn't that long um nope nothing else I can say about that so I'm just gonna spit out stuff that I don't know about yet I mentioned my I mentioned these podcasts that I'm making in my journal that I'm writing <laughs> so now they're referring to each other in that journal I wrote a story about uh how I first, how I, uh, how I wrote my first chapter of manga, and uh, I don't want to say that story here because that story is over there, but no one's going to read over there because I haven't even shared my journal. But no one's going to listen to this either because I haven't even shared this. So it's a, it's a mixed up bag of nothingness. What am I going to do now? What am I going to do now? The reason I want to learn how to sight read is because you know I want to be a music composer and I think that it's, it's a useful technique to have. And I also, um, well, actually, the real reason that I want to learn a sight read is kind of like, I went to this choir thing that my mom kind of forced me to go to, where we were doing, we had to sing Gregorian chant, and we had the, the notation there in front of us. And, it, you know, you can kind of read notation by just like listening to what other people are singing and also looking at like whether a note is going higher or lower. But I want to. I felt kind of like off because I wouldn't. I wasn't able to sing as loudly as I could. And so I want to be able to sing. If if I'm gonna join a choir or sing in a choir, I want to be able to sing as loudly as I can, 
or as loudly as is needed. I want to be able to sing with confidence. I want to be able to know what those notes are with confidence and not have to follow along with what other people are doing in order to figure out what those notes are. So I wanted to learn how to read that. So I tried to look up how to read that and found out that it's even more complicated to read that than it is to read like normal music, st- like this, the, the five, five the, the staff, the normal music staff that's in music theory today. It's more complicated than that because there's so many different things that represent different things, so many different symbols that represent different things. I guess they were, back in those days, they were still trying to figure out how to do Gregorian chant. But anyways, I felt embarrassed about not having known that, and so I was like, I tried to look up. I thought, I thought that Gregorian chant would be something very simple to read because it was like a, a, a what do you call it, a primitive version of our of our current musical theory. But I've just found. But what I found out, you know, I already said. But I found out is that primitive does not necessarily mean. Um, does not necessarily mean less complicated. Sometimes it means more complicated because they didn't have as easy of a way to indicate how long you're supposed to hold a note. They didn't have beats. They didn't have beats yet. And so they had to just like add all these weird symbols that represented holding notes. Really weird stuff that I don't like too much. But anyways, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to learn that because I don't want to run into embarrassment again and not be able to read a song as it's being sung. I don't know. It just seems like it's a good skill to have if you're a musician or if you're a composer. I feel like I'm blathering on in a way that is so incoherent. I can't even hear or remember any of the things I've previously said. That's how bad I am at this, you know? Talking off the cuff. And it's not always that I'm bad at this, because I figured out something about talking off the cuff. What you have to do is you have to not be yourself, not entirely, because when I'm being myself, I'm not going to say anything, because that's what I normally do. I don't say anything. So you have to kind of switch who you are as a character. You have to play a character. You have to act it out. Act out what you're doing. Act out the kind of enthusiasm that would be needed for a podcast like this. And once you do that, your brain will automatically start thinking of things to say, or at least start thinking of the the, the proper beats that have to come out. And so that's what I'm doing. Ah, man, four whole minutes left. I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what to do. Man, I've run out of topics. Um, Shoot. Shoot me now. What do I talk about? What do I talk about for the remaining time? I'm just going to talk about what I'm going to talk about, but I don't know what that is. I am lost in a complete mesmerizing traveler's log of soup can sauce, and I don't know how to climb out of the bowl. And I also don't have the proper tools to be able to climb out of the bowl because the bowl is too slippery. It's slipperier than a bathtub, so I'm stuck. And the giant is about to eat me, and I don't want to be eaten by the giant, so someone help me out of this bowl. He went over to go, you know, talk to his wife for a little bit, and I have some time. I just need help getting out of the bowl. That's what I need. So help me get out of the bowl. That was the stupidest thing that I've ever done in my life. But whatever. I don't think that it was that stupid. But it was stupid in the context of a podcast where I talk about my life. Um, what else can I do? What else am I trying to do? I had things in mind that I wanted to say, but I don't remember anymore. My whole, um, the whole way my memory works is weird. I guess, okay, the way that my brain works... I'm afraid of getting old, and I'm afraid of not being flexible as I get old, because that's what I hear happens when you get old. When you get old, your brain changes the way that it forms things. Instead of being flexible and movable and malleable, it becomes crystallized. Like you become very certain of yourself and certain of things that you, like you have certain opinions about things, and it's very much it's a lot more difficult and it's a lot more difficult to 
remove or change those opinions as you get older. And that's something that I've seen in old people. Uh, there's an old person, uh, uh, my brother Chris's friend, uh, Hazel, who has this problem where the first impression she gets of a person is the impression that she stays with. Like, if she hates the person at first, even if that person turns out to be a great person later, and this is something she recognizes in herself. It's very weird. She recognizes this, that it's a problem, but it still happens. If a person gives off a bad first impression, then forever that person is going to be that person in their mind, or in her mind, in Hazel's mind. So uh, that scares me. It scares me that that can happen, and I don't want that to happen. But inevitably, it has to happen, right? That's the way that the human brain works. I suppose you can be somewhat a little bit more flexible by constantly doing new things and constantly making new things, constantly improving yourself. But how flexible can you really get? I mean, I watched a YouTube video where a guy tried to learn how to ride a backward bicycle, and it took him like six months to do it. It's like six whole months to do it, all right? That's a long time. And then he had his kid try to learn how to do it, and it took the kid like a week because the kid's brain was more flexible. It's cool, but it's also scary. And I've reached the 10-minute mark. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a lot of filler, but I hope you enjoyed it. Anyways, the end. So, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I... I've been trying to learn Japanese for the last year or so. I started off because I, I listened to a podcast where some girl said that she learned Jap uh, she learned English by watching just by watching American cartoons. She was able to pick up enough English to learn. So I wanted to try that with Japanese. So I went about watching a bunch of Japanese anime without subtitles to see if it if if it would do that for me. And I was kind of worried about it because uh, this girl who learned English by watching American cartoons, she um, she was a kid when she did that. And I'm wondering if when you're a child it's easier to learn something like that. I've heard that you learning languages is easier. And, you know, I haven't really learned that much Japanese, even though I've watched a lot of anime without subtitles. So uh, eventually, after, you know, like six months or so of watching anime without subtitles and not getting anywhere. I mean, I did learn a few words, but not that many. Uh, I just uh, decided to just try one of the classic methods. Well, not classic, but one of the another different method, you know. I decided to download the, uh, what's it called? The Pimsleur method. The Pimsleur method is basically an MP3, a series of MP3s that you listen to that it asks you to Basically, it forces you to form sentences in Japanese and then speak them, and also to listen to sentences. And uh, it's teaching you by audio rather than by paper. Because learning a language, the way that we learn languages as human beings, is we learn it by listening. We don't actually learn it by reading. That's like an, uh, a very ineffective way of doing it. It would take you forever to learn it by reading. It would take you a lot less time to learn it by just listening to listening to it and repeating and you know you have to form the sentences in your own head and that's basically what the Pimsleur method is it's just like mp3s you listen to them and they teach you how to form sentences and get you forming sentences within the first lesson you have to you, you start speaking within the first lesson uh so i'm trying to do that um i ran into there's like trouble that i run into when i'm doing it though because i i, I tend to like I decided kind of like I was going to do one a day, and then I moved from one a day to one every business day, because I don't feel like doing it on my break days, which might be affecting like the, the effectiveness of this. But I, when you don't want to do something, it's hard to pay attention to it, because there are some days where I just don't want to do it, and so I'm just doing it to get it over with. I think that it's important to do it anyways, whether you want to or not. Like, for instance, I don't really want to record this this podcast, this episode of this podcast right now. But I'm going to try and do one every day. And not one every business day, but one every break day too. One every single day. See how long I can do that. And if I get tired of it, if I get bored of it, if I 
think that it's not helping me at all, I'll stop. But whatever. But anyways, the problem that I ran into, or that I'm running into while doing this, learning Japanese, uh, while listening to these MP3s, is that I can't focus on. When I don't feel like doing it, when I don't feel in the mood to do it, I can't focus on what they're saying, and it takes me forever. And you're supposed to kind of listen to these MP3s, and they say, like, after you listen to the MP3, if you get about 80% of the things right, then you're then you're good, you can go on to the next one. Sometimes it takes me, like, three or four listens before I can get 80% of the correct, correct answers, because I'm so bad at paying attention to these things, sometimes. And sometimes, like, there's sometimes I can just get it in all in one go. It all depends on my mood and also on the easiness of the mp3 and certain words are easier to remember than other words like there's certain words i've kind of devised a method of, of my own making to memorize certain words because they have you learn words in the midst of this like they give you the word they pronounce it slowly you, you repeat the pronunciation that's supposed to make you remember it but it doesn't it never i never quite remember it i only sometimes so i've devised a way of like trying to like when a word gets brought up, I try to think of what it sounds like in English and then just associate it with something in my brain. So I at least have some way to recall it besides just recalling the actual sounds, which I don't think is... I think that's actually the way that children learn language at first. Because I remember a long time ago, um, my sister, Lily, she... Uh, let me see. She said, I remember recording a video of her singing a song, and she was singing, uh, I, I guess I gotta repeat the song, it was a, a song about Jesus, it went, Jesus, Jesus, can I tell you how I feel? But the way that she sang it was, Jesus, Jesus, can I tell how I felt? And it was like she was, can I tell how, she was just using the words that, that she thought that they sounded like and not necessarily even remembering and that's what i remember like with other prayers that i learned i'm a catholic by the way if you don't know but by other prayers that i learned like the the remember most gracious virgin Mary, that like whatever i wouldn't ever say the actual words i would say what the words sounded like until like you know in adulthood when i finally looked up what it what, what it actually said and realized that i was saying the wrong words or whatever so I think that that's the way that you're supposed to learn. You're supposed to kind of associate the word with something, with something that you, you're familiar with. So that's what I'm doing. So an example of this would be the uh, the Japanese word for office is uh, jimusho, jimusho. And so I immediately associated that with, uh, you know, the show The Office. One of the characters in The Office <laughs> is Jim. And so like, it's like jimusho. It's like Jim's show. <laughs> it's the show that has Jim in it, and that's how I associate that. And I can uh, that that makes that made it really easy to remember. I did not ever. I never forgot that. And so I think it's important to do that. But sometimes these words don't have any associations with like um, the word for bathroom and the, the formal word for bathroom. The regular word for bathroom easy toire. It's toilet, right? But the formal word for bathroom is oteare. O o o oteare wa. Uh, but and I I could not for the life of me think of what that sounded like. I could probably if I tried it now come up with something that it sounds like, but um, I couldn't I couldn't think of anything at the time. And I didn't I hadn't even devised the idea to do that at the time because I thought that was cheating or something. <laughs> but but then I realized kids do that and kids learn language faster than anybody else. So I might as well do what they're doing. I might as well learn from the experts at learning language and do that. So yeah, mnemonic devices are important, and they're like a central part of the way the human mind works. If you can associate it with anything, associate it. Like junbi. Junbi is the word for preparation in Japan, and I just like, I just associate it with like, June is the time when the bees come to, <laughs> to collect honey, when they don't, because it's in spring, but it doesn't matter. I just, that's what I associate, June plus bee. And then like, I can remember the word easier, even if it's not even connected with what it means preparation i guess springtime preparation in june bees have to prepare the honey prepare the the the, the pollen from the flowers to get honey so there is kind of a, an association there but it's very loose but even with that very loose association it makes it a lot easier to remember so that's what i've been doing um i'm still watching japanese uh anime without subtitles 
I've been kind of confused about how to do it right because I think I was doing it wrong for a very long time and I think I finally started doing it right. But to be fair and to be honest, I have thought that a lot of times I've thought, oh, I was doing it wrong then, but now I'm doing it right. I've done that like at least four times, had a shift in, in the way that I the way that I watch anime without subtitles to try and understand things. And it's always been kind of wrong anyways. So I don't know if this one's right. I don't know if I finally arrived at the real right way to do things. But um, before, what I would do is I would try to focus on everything that was being said. And if I didn't understand everything that was being said, then I wouldn't, um, I didn't understand what they were saying. And um, I, I think that that's the wrong way to go about things, once again. I think that you should just, if you're, if you're going to listen to someone speak in a language that you don't understand, and, and, and sometimes I would like, I would think that like whenever I hear a, a word that was in English or whatever, um, I would think that it was cheating because like, uh, I already know that word. It's cheating. That's, that's stupid. I, I, I shouldn't congratulate myself for recognizing a word that was said in English. That's stupid. That's stupid. It's cheating. But then I realized that like, I think it is a good way, like, the, the best way that I've found so far, after all of this practice or whatever of doing it, the best way that I've found of watching Japanese or watching any language that you don't understand is you don't listen to everything that's being said. Well, you do, but you only focus on the things that you recognize, because eventually you'll recognize patterns. If you recognize that a word has been said before, that's when you want to focus on it. That's when you want to try and figure out what it means. Um... Because otherwise, you're just going to be like, just constantly barraged with not understanding anything that's being said. you got to focus on the things that you do understand and try to formulate what that sentence means based upon that one thing. And it's pretty easily, so it's pretty easy sometimes, you know? Someone says like, usually one or two words is enough for you to understand what's going on because there's so much context in the tone of voice that they're using and there's so much context in the you know, the things that happened before, the the thing that's being viewed on screen, there's so much stuff. Uh, so as a result of watching anime without subtitles, I've also, like, tried to go through, like, which ones are easiest to understand without subtitles. And I found that, like, even children's shows aren't that easy. Like, there's this show called Bono Bono. I think it's supposed to be a children's show. It doesn't look like an adult show. <laughs> it's very simply drawn. It's about animals talking to each other. And I can hardly understand. But for some reason, I can hardly understand anything they're saying in that. But then there's other there's other shows that aren't children's shows, like Inuyasha. For some reason, Inuyasha, I can understand every single thing that's being said. Even if I don't understand the words, I understand exactly what's going on. That that show is able to communicate without language at all. And there are certain shows that are like that. There's not that many, but there are certain ones that just have that ability to communicate. Um, another one is... Uh, Card Captor Sakura. I, I think that's just because it's a, a very simplistic show, anyways, and pretty much it's it's obvious what they're doing, and they're going to be obvious about what they're saying they're doing, pretty much like, and it's it's slice of life. But um, I can tell pretty much almost <laughs> everything that's being said without knowing the words, you know, without knowing the words, I can tell almost everything that's happening, everything that they're doing, and that's something that's rare to find in the anime. I found. But um, I don't know if that's actually helpful. I don't know if it's actually helpful to find anime that it's easy to understand what's happening because then your brain will be like, well, I, under I already get what's happening, so I don't need to understand the words, right? <laughs> it might be better to look up to watch anime that you don't quite understand what's happening. So your brain's like, well, what's happening? I got to figure this out. And it'll be more, you know, <laughs> more encouraged to, to figure out what the words mean and figure out what the sentence is being said. So I don't know which way is the right way. I'm still kind of confused about it, but I'm hoping that at some point I will be able to watch uh, anime without, you know, subtitles and be able to understand everything, at least, or at least 90% of the things that are being said. That's like my dream. I don't even really want to go, like, like, learn Japanese to be able to speak to people in Japanese. I just want to be able to watch anime without subtitles because that's cool. That's the reason that I started learning Japanese. Being able to, I, I'm not even going to learn how to, how to read, really. I don't really want to go through the, the <laughs> I don't want to go through the pain of learning every single kanji ever but um I do want to be able to watch Japanese anime without subtitles and that's the reason yeah I've already said it and uh I guess this is 13 minutes in so this is a good length to stop uh hope you enjoyed it 
Uh, see you at the next Coquino podcast. Don't even know if I'm going to upload these yet, but maybe I will. So see you next time.